traffic jam. Oh, this we're is pushing cool. it. Yeah. <laughs> we're pushing the boat out of the way. This is a good way to move the boat. Yeah. <laughs> this is the only way to move the boat. I love that. I wish I could do that when cars park in front of me. <laughs> that was amazing. That was amazing. Cambodia is not just temples, monks, and shrines like we saw in our previous episode. While its ancient history is one of sprawling civilization building massive monuments to honor its ruling god kings, the more recent history of Cambodia is bloodier and far more sordid. The country was devastated by a genocide in the 1970s, led by Pol Pot and his ruthless regime, the Khmer Rouge. Because of his desire for a perfectly equal agrarian utopia, his soldiers executed over 80% of Khmer doctors and teachers. The Khmer Rouge also placed hundreds of thousands of landmines intending to blow up their own people, and as a result, massacred two million Cambodians, or one quarter of the population. After the regime fell, the nation had to start from the ground up. That's why this developing country is actually considered to be one of the world's youngest nations. Over half the population is under the age of 27, but the Cambodian people remain resilient and hopeful for the future. In 2005, the Anchor Photo Festival started as a local event showcasing the art of Cambodian photographers. It has since grown into Southeast Asia's longest running photography event with exhibitions from all over Asia and an eye towards fostering a self-sustainable model of professional education and development within the local photography community. I met up with the director of the festival, Jessica Lim, to learn more. What is the Angkor Photo Festival? Well, it's an international photography event. We started in 2005. And the main thing that we do actually is every year we organize workshop for Asian photographers. We've had our 15th edition this year and about 400 alumni. And around the workshop, what we do is a public program of festivals. So that would be exhibitions and talks and popular reviews. And uh, every evening we get together and do a bit of a slideshow projection under the stars. So it's a bit of a yearly annual meetup for photographers in the region. And it's free to attend? Yeah, completely free. Uh, it's one of our main values actually. Uh, we really believe in being affordable and accessible, especially being where we are. Uh, we felt that this was something that the region really needed. And you know, Siam Reap is a really great location in terms of uh, it's easy for people to travel here and it's uh, not a very expensive place to be. So this allows us to reach out to more people who might otherwise not be able to afford uh, attending an event like this. So this is uh, Days in the Sun that's curated by Hadao and Lin Pang. They have a fantastic collective in Vietnam called Matka. So are these archival photos? They feel... They are. And these are all archival images from the master of studio photography in uh, Vietnam. For them, it was about understanding the history of Vietnamese photography because they felt that a lot of uh, Vietnam photographic history was very colonial based. So he, Lin actually started researching what, about the Vietnamese photographers and what, who were they and what did they do and this is how it uh, came about. Yeah. It was great, yeah. I lo I, it looks like around, this is 50s or 60s. Yeah. It's very nostalgic. I mean, uh, I love the suits and by the waterfall. That, that, that is yeah. really interesting. Yeah, because even the hats and I mean, look at the, the traditional People dresses. People definitely dress spiffier back then. I don't know what happened to it. But I don't uh, know how <laughs> they got ready every morning. You know, I mean, it, it, it takes me 30 minutes. Imagine if I had to put all this stuff on. Oh, this is great. I'm going to come back next year as well. For the festival? Yeah. Get yeah. ready. If you'll you have me. You can start booking your flights now. Actually. Yeah, I can, I can. While much of the nation is still below the poverty line, there are efforts to create more infrastructure for the Khmer people. Early in the morning on my second day in Siem Reap, I met up with Thomas Tam, a Fujifilm ex-photographer and consultant to several NGOs located throughout Asia. His goal is to highlight the living conditions of impoverished children, those most in need of help, and to advocate for the education and well-being of rural Cambodians. Together with Sithi, our local guide, we journeyed to Kompom Pluk, one of the most fascinating towns on earth, to learn about how the people live here right at the water's edge. 
Because right now the water level is very low. Uh, do, do you often get to walk around here in the village? No, this is actually my first time walking on, uh, in the village as it's usually flooded and you never get to, to walk like this. This is really cool. Yeah, and then during the wet season when the, the water is the highest level, this is just all underwater anyway. Yeah, 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 all underwater. So you, you can't even walk. We'd be diving now. We'd be swimming through, <laughs> swimming through the village. Yeah. I think getting here when we arrived, it just kind of struck out to me as just an alien landscape. These houses, because it's kind of getting into the dry season, they're just on these high stilts, so you have to use your imagination a little bit. What is it like when literally the ground we're standing on is completely covered in water? It's a completely different place. And it's not something that we're used to seeing in the West, you know, a, a village that looks like it's suspended or floating on water. So it's automatically just extra interesting to me as a photographer and it actually makes it a little bit more difficult because it's also overwhelming. I, I haven't seen too many places like this, so I have to spend a lot of time exploring because everything looks so interesting to me. I have to really work to find what's truly interesting because it looks so it all looks cool. Everything, I wanna photograph everything, but I really have to hone in on what's most important. You know, what tells the story of how people live here. Thomas, so I see, I see color and texture everywhere. But, yeah. you're, but you're the master of photographing people. What, what, what to you creates the soul of the image? Is it faces? Is it, is it the people themselves? And what, what are you looking for here? Storyline is important. You must have a good story. Uh, in order to do justice uh, to the people, I must capture it truthfully to, to represent their voice, the plight of the people. And that is the soul of documentary and photography is the yeah, truth, yes. is, is showing the truth in a compelling yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it's like uh, my, my job is to study in the way the weather they need um, any help, but usually I believe in empowerment. Empowerment is a, is a better word to use. Yeah. Um, they are very good in, in certain things. Um, you look at them, they have um, strong coping mechanism in, in adapting to different environments. Uh, but what is the strength? You know, they, 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 they can uh, survive for so many years or even excel in it. So we are here, um, they are looking at this opportunity to empower them to be even stronger than so you help amplify their own yes, voice. right, yeah. And you're trying to get that candid moment. Yeah. The reality yeah, yeah, of the, the situation. Actions, the actions, the eyes, um, the way they interact uh, with a non-verbal cue. I think non-verbal non -verbal cue is something that is um, powerful if you can capture that. So I approach them, I usually have to not stage them, unless it's portrayed in this different. But if a documentary, I just approach them gently. I like the way that these two like... Yeah, yeah. You see, they're so focused yeah. in the work. <laughs> yeah, they're good at they're it. Like, so, wow, yes, such a skilled uh, mechanic. So, Sithi, what are we hearing? This, this oh, noise? this is a funeral. Oh, how long does that go on? I would say one to three days, mostly. Sometimes up to a week, but wow. you know. All right. I just can't get over the, the color and texture here. I mean, it's beautiful. And it's amazing how much it transforms, just what it takes to, to live here and deal with such a drastic difference of being able to actually walk on land or not being able to and have to go everywhere by boat. It's a resilience that the people have here. Uh, it's inspiring, actually. Hi. It's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm becoming very aware that I have a giant camera. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's easy for me to like get people to look at me because they're like, what is he doing? Oh, that's nice. The reflection. Kind of watching what he's doing and uh, just trying to capture it in motion. He was sort of casting the net. So I focused on him and then just kept the focus locked and waited for the, the net. I'm not sure if I got it though. And now he's done. See, just like that. So if I, maybe I got it. I can't cheat and say, hey man, kid, can you please go create a candid moment for me? I did get it, but I got him dynamically moving his net in and out of the water, so that's cool. You just have to be quick and you have to be extremely observant, extremely observant. When you're documenting this, how are you careful to not exploit the people or the situation? I believe as long as you pick up the camera, and we're shooting the people, we are actually exploiting, usually exploiting them. But the difference is that, what is the purpose? If there's a purpose, a driven purpose at the end, then whatever we captured, we actually help the people. But if not, if there's no intention of helping them and we captured them for the moment for 
competition, for contests, you know, that is expectation. It's extreme expectation to me. That makes sense. Having a purpose, telling a story, trying to impact change rather yeah. than just looking for something for Instagram yes. to get likes. Right. The right. visual element yes. of it can be compelling, right. but it's the direction yeah. and how you use it that matters. So I noticed I'm, I'm shooting sort of telephoto because I'm, I'm shy. So I like standing far away, like oh. a ninja, you know, and just yeah, like... Yeah, 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 it's still, it's still good. It's still, I think it's long lens, you still get a good, yeah. good shot. So. I, th I think it's interesting too, but yeah. let's say you're approaching, you're approaching somebody yeah. and you want to approach them, it's better to be intimate yeah, yeah, because yeah. your lens is a medium lens, so you're going you're gonna to be closer than me. Yeah, correct. Like I'm kind of like a sniper yeah, trying yeah, to hide yeah, myself, yeah. but to tell a real story and to get that candid feeling, you should be engaging with them. Yeah, right? yeah. you just have to get very close. You know, this I shoot is close and I go low. Okay. This, my, my style is very low. Very low. Yeah. Oh, here you go. Okay, coming. You're ah, fast. He's fast. You're Superman. <laughs> so years I train myself to shoot before watching the in the viewfinder. And you just shoot. You just somehow you must know the lens well. The that's anchor. that's it too. With landscape yeah. photography, I'm always just dealing with light, but light lasts longer. Like these moments are so fast. So fast, yeah, so fast. So fast. Yeah. Hello. Do you wanna see? Yeah. Handsome, huh? <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. After seeing Kampung Pluk and hearing about the efforts to modernize even this remote village, I was excited to see what else this area had to offer. So we hopped back on the boats and arrived at... More boats? Oh, uh, <laughs> traffic jam. <laughs> oh, we're cool. pushing it! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're pushing the boat out of the way. This yeah. is a good way to move the boat. Yeah. This is the only way to move the boat. I love that. I wish I could do that when cars park in front of me. <laughs> that was amazing. That was amazing. I'm really enjoying the close-up shots with the telephoto, but I also have a medium, 25 to 50. So I think I'm going to start with this, and then I'm going to see how it goes on the boats. Ah, I cannot stop shooting. I know. There's so much. Look at this lady. It's amazing, actually. Are these boats just for tourists? Right now, yes. But actually, it was not designed for tourists, though. It was just a fishing boat. And then when tourists started to come and, you know, people started to ask for the service to go through this mango forest. And then they realized that this is, could be a business opportunity for them. How much? One dollar and a half. Well, I can give you a five. Some, some uh, change. Coffee. Oh, there you go. I love coffee. How much for that? Five dollars. Five dollars for soda and this? This alone is five dollars. Oh, that alone is five dollars. That is two dollars. Okay, let's do that with the yeah. soda. Okay. Yeah, that works. Yep. She doesn't have change. Oh. This is three dollars. Five dollars. Um, so three, four, five is fine. Yeah, that's fine. It's so all five? All five dollars. Okay, yeah. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, 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 no. No, no, no. no, no, no. Bad, bad. <laughs> wow. This is definitely a unique experience. Yeah, look at the light. That's incredible. I feel like I'm in the bayou of Louisiana, but I know I'm in Cambodia. What, what is this place? Well, obviously we are still in Kampung Phuk uh, village, but we are in the mangrove forest part of the village. Uh, this is some kind of a wetland, like during the dry season, I would like say in March or April, there's no water here. We would be just walking around here. But in wet season, the, wat the water just fill up the forest and go all the way up to, I would say 60% of the trees. It's just beautiful. I don't know how to describe it. Just, you know, it's, it's nice, right? It's hauntingly beautiful. Yeah. Tourism is hugely boosting the Cambodian economy, particularly with those children who survived the Khmer Rouge and are now growing into adulthood. Sithi is part of that young generation of entrepreneurs making a living for themselves using all the tools at their disposal. In his case, adding photography to his existing tours and excursions has been a big boost for business. 
I, I love how you started with photography as a utility to fill your website and run your business. Yeah. And then it transformed into a passion. Yeah. Photography is not just to have a photo for my website or to impress people, but it expands for me to telling, trying to tell stories of what's going on uh, in my community, in, uh, in my area. And basically I'm trying to do everything from landscape, street, portrait, everything. It's an amazing tool to speak to the world. It's amazing. It is, and something else that's amazing about photography is it's a way of communicating, but also being a photographer is sort of an international language and something that we can share together. Yeah. And it transcends culture, religion, race, because yeah. it's something we can all enjoy together. Yeah. And the, because of the internet, uh, we have this global community of photographers. And we can connect and do things yeah, like yeah, yeah. this together. Absolutely. Siti and I had a great time floating around on the lazy river inside of the mangrove forest. But you know, I couldn't leave Cambodia without going to one last temple. It just wouldn't be right. It's no doubt that a sunrise at Angkor Wat is the crowning jewel for photographers, but it's important to remember that Angkor Wat is not the only temple. There are so many temples around here, and my favorite temple is actually Bayan Temple. And it's famous for all of the stone faces. And historically, it's said that there were over 200 of these faces, but obviously over the years, the wear and tear, even with the restoration, many of them have been lost. Anchor Tom was built as a perfect square with each side facing north, south, east, and west. And at the center of the walled city sits Bayon Temple. And it's said to represent the intersection of heaven and earth. It's a pretty awesome place to do wedding photos, I have to admit it. One of the really cool things about this temple, there are all these long corridors and it's fantastic for photography. All the light comes in, even during the middle of the day, you can take advantage of the harsh light and have these cool lit environments down these long, dramatic corridors. When you visit Bayon Temple, make sure you climb all the way to the top because it's here that you can see all of the stone faces, but just be warned, if it's December or January, that's peak tourist season. Uh, if you do want to get a selfie here, definitely wear some bright colored clothing, uh, unlike myself, but that's okay, because I'm behind the camera. Okay, well, I think we found the official selfie spot. There's a literal line of people standing and waiting for it. It's really difficult to photograph in here just because it's close quarters, full of people, hard to get a real good establishing shot of the whole compound, but I know the perfect place. It's actually at the southwest corner. I've gone all around here, and at this corner, you can actually see every single one of the spires through the trees. It just takes a little bit of exploring. And the nice thing is, unlike being inside the temple, there aren't really many people over here because the main attraction is actually going into the temple and uh, you know, getting those selfies and posing next to the faces. So this is about the spot, but that's not good. Got some scaffolding. Actually, that's horrible, that's horrible. So this shot doesn't work for me. Let's check another side, maybe there's some water. Maybe we'll get lucky, I have no idea. And let's watch out for that guy there. <laughs> <laughs> Respect the monkey. Respect the monkey. Okay, this looks promising. It's the dry season, but there's some water here. Might be able to pull off a reflection shot. And most importantly, there's no scaffolding on this side of the temple. So let's kind of explore here. I think I'm gonna try a few handheld shots. And then if I find something that I like, I'll go ahead and get the tripod. It's a little, is buggy a word? But yeah, that, that might work. That might actually work. Now the trick is finding the right composition because as I move back and forth here, the parallax of the spires changes. So I wonder if there's a good spot where I can kind of see them all. Southwest corner was best to see them all, but this is kind of what I'm left with just because of the scaffolding. I think right now I have about an hour before sunset, which means I need to be set up in about 20 minutes. So I'm gonna move around just to make sure that I like the final landing point for the one shot that I'm gonna be able to get. 
once I find it, I'm going to set up the tripod and hopefully these clouds turn into something nice because clouds here in Cambodia are kind of rare. So having a sky like this could turn out to be really nice for sunset. This is going to be the spot. Oh, danger close to the swamp. And I'm kind of rethinking my shoe choice now because I'm, I'm sinking in. And in order to get this reflection, I have to be like super close to this little swampy area. So I'm going to set the tripod up really close to it. Let the tripod take some of the mud instead of my feet. The first thing I want to talk about with this shot is the composition. Now, this is really swampy. And instead of trying to hide the fact that it's swampy with all this grass, I'm utilizing it. So I went really low to pull the reflection down into the grass. And I positioned the center of the temple to the center of my frame as well. So I have a mirrored reflection. Now my horizon line is not exactly centered. It's actually rotated up just a little bit so that I have more sky than reflection. Since I'm shooting around 25 millimeter, the objects close to the camera are not gonna be fully in focus. So what I'm actually doing is taking one shot focused on the background, which in this case is the temple, and then I'm moving my focus square all the way down to the bottom to take an additional shot of the swamp. What I'll do in post-processing is take both images, the background and the foreground, put them together so that every single area of the image will be tack sharp. All right, that about wraps it up. I don't think the sky is gonna get any better. It's getting kind of dark and we need to get out of here because the mosquitoes are starting to come out as well. So time to pack it up. And there you have it, a beautiful sunset in one of my favorite places on the planet. It's a fitting end to Moments in Time season two and what has been an incredible experience traveling and photographing Southeast Asia. I hope to be back on the road soon to share more destinations and the incredible people that capture them. In the meantime, I've created a playlist of all 17 episodes on my YouTube channel. From Malaysia, to Japan, to the Netherlands, to Spain. It's been a wonderful journey and I hope you'll join me again soon. But that leaves one big question. Where on earth should I go next? Let's keep this discussion going in the comments below. Who asked you?